Conference Center in Barcelona, Spain. It's The Cube at HP Discover Barcelona 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Barcelona, in Europe, for HP Discover 2014. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Andy Weinberger, who is the General Manager and Vice President of Augmented Reality and Multi-Channel Optimization for HP. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much. Um, love the title. Uh, augmented Reality, Multi-Channel. This is the cloud era, right? You can do a lot of things now as possible. So explain to the folks what that means. Obviously, augmented reality, we see wearable, all these new things happening, a lot of software behind the scenes from business cards or whatever. Uh, talk about what is augmented reality and multi-channel from your perspective. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I think especially marketers are really looking for SaaS solutions, and that's kind of where we're going um, in the marketing optimization group under HP Software. Um, and uh, the two products that I look after are completely SaaS based. So augmented reality is, you know, it sounds like a very geeky sci-fi term. Um, I, I think it's a really simple wit concept actually of um, bridging the physical world with the digital world. So being able to, you know, take your phone and through our app or our technology plugged into another app, actually just hold it over an object, an image or a location and get a really engaging, interactive experience. So it must be exciting for you and your job because um, you know, you're at the, the, the intersection of big data, large scale compute. We're now in that era where we have all this stuff on now, software on top of it, enables a lot of cool things. So, you know, what are some of the cool things you're working on? Give some examples of how, you know, augmenting reality, which is a virtual space, and we're broadcasting here from a physical space into, into a virtual space, um, and then multi-channel is now long tail distribution on everything. You could test a variety of combinations, so you have a big data challenge, and you have, you know, unlimited, essentially compute if you're talking about SaaS. So, explain some exciting things that you're working on. Yeah, actually, um, Andrew Joyner and I were talking with a customer recently, and um, you know, it was a bank, um, and they're really kind of taking from the perspective of their their store and their focus is no longer kind of the presence of the actual bank. It's their website. Um, that's where their customers go. That's where they get their information, um, and so. What's great about that is that there is, as you say, kind of a lot of data underneath that. Customers are constantly telling us what they want to see, what they're interested in, and all we have to do is listen. Um, the hard part is taking that data and making sense of it, and that's what we focus on is grabbing data from all the different places, social, the actual website, call center, and taking it and making a very relevant, targeted experience. It's interesting, Dave and I are big uh, students of digital media, the transformation that's happening, we're part of, and, and the things that you're working on really speaks to this really big digital transformation where with big data, with cloud, with SaaS, you can now have a digital component to all aspects of the business you mentioned, you know, merging as customer support to you know, go to market selling stuff. So there's a variety of, of spectrum. So everything's now digital. So the digital experience with the consumerization is a real trend and it's, you know, people are now realizing I don't need this siloed product tool. So you're seeing a kind of an integration challenge around tooling. Hey, this used to be my listening tool, this is my customer service app, and I have data, and now those are lifting up into this kind of common, unified approach. Do you see it that way, and what are the, some of the things that you see um, customers, your customers, challenge with in this digital transformation? Yeah, so I think having multiple channels is still very, very important. Customers want to be able to interact in many different ways with their, their you know, vendors and their partners. Um, but the important thing is making that a seamless experience. So, you know, there should be no difference in the information or the experience, whether you are calling into the call center, or going to the website, or interacting on social media, um, or receiving a statement in the mail. Um, it should all have the exact same information and all be relevant to that person. Um, and that's where the big data comes in. So being able to leverage all of that data and provide the very consistent experience across all those channels. So what is the big data autonomy? Is it an autonomy solution? What do you guys, what's the, what's the, what's make, what makes up your uh, products that you're selling? So I mean, I think big data in itself just exists. Um, we leverage it across all of the different software portfolios. So um, we're focused on leveraging big data for marketers and being able to talk to our customers and engage our customers in a way that's meaningful. Um, and I think that marketers are kind of the tip of the spear that are leading the charge in that, in the respect. 
I just so wrote a post on Forbes uh, this past week called the Marketing Cloud, and really talking about Oracle and obviously their challenge there. And you got Oracle, Guadalupe, you got Salesforce, you got LinkedIn now going into this marketing cloud concept. That's actually what you're talking about is marketing, digital cloud, if you will. Um, What's the landscape like for you guys competitive wise? Is that Oracle, is it other people? What are your key competitors? Yeah, I mean, I think every everyone's got to go to the cloud. A lot of people are talking now about moving to the cloud. The good news is we've been there for a while. Um, so I've always managed the SaaS solutions that have been around for about 10 years. They've always been SaaS based, cloud based. Um, and so I think, you know, depending on what the, what the customer's looking for, it could be Oracle, it could be Salesforce, but um, I, I don't think it's like a, a cloud, that's just what everyone has to get to, and it's kind of who can get there first. It's kind of a no-brainer, so it's like, you, some people just say they're trying to get sales solutions, kind of think Salesforce, okay, funneling names into a database, yeah. their workflow, uh, to different digital solutions. You mentioned the multi-channel optimization algorithmically having variations. Is, is there a lot of different separation points between uh, digital, some of the digital things that you're seeing out there? Is that how I should look at it? What should, how should people look at this? It's kind of confusing, like, well, am I, is it for sales leads or is it for customer experience? You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, hard to figure yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sales has always had, you know, and I think Salesforce does a great job because it's a very defined way of tracking a lead. Um, I think that when you're looking at the, the broader life cycle of a customer, once they kind of become your customer, how do you interact with them? Um, and that's kind of where we focus. Uh, it obviously can be used for the acquisition phases as well, the communications that goes out to gather those customers, but um, really the whole life cycle. So I got to ask you the question about retar um, retargeting. Or um, um, when I go to a web page, I go hit the Hilton site, look for a vacation, no rooms available. Then I go to Facebook and all of a sudden I see Hilton ads yeah. all over the place. I'm like, what? I really don't want to see that. So that, that's kind of a big data problem. Probably it works well in click throughs, but actually I'm not interested in in that product. So um, this whole retargeting thing has been kind of an interesting conversation. Um, is that good or bad, or is there any innovations to make that better? I mean, I don't think there's, you know, good or bad, it's all, you know, generational mainly, that, you know, what people want to see or what they don't want to see. But I think that it, it comes down to kind of how it's treated and constantly learning. So you know that if you do retarget to somebody and, and they're not clicking on that, that they might not appreciate it, and they might think it's a little big brothery. Yeah. Um, but you know, some people really appreciate that because maybe they dropped the browser and they lost their place. So um, I think it's just about listening to customers constantly, learning and testing to make sure that you're doing the right thing. So Andy, let's talk about your products because you you okay. run two cool products, Erasmo yeah. and Optimost. Yes. So let's start with Erasmo. Um, well, I'll explain each of those and then let's get into them. Okay, so Erasmo is um, HP's augmented reality platform. Um, we have an app as well as an SDK that we you know, for, to provide for customers to put in their app. Um, and it, as I mentioned, allows them to do augmented reality. So they can um, take their advertising, their catalogs, their marketing materials, their statements, um, and essentially light those up so that when you hold your phone or tablet over that image, um, it provides a kind of a link to anything digital. So you can get take them to an educational video, you can have a quiz, um, you can provide them more information. It's a very interactive and engaging experience. So what are you seeing in terms of how having um, that experience powered by Erasma, how does that differ from sort of a traditional engagement? Can you share any metrics? I mean, are you seeing, I, I, presumably you're seeing higher rates of engagement. I mean, that's why you would do this, right? So how high? What are you, what are you yeah, seeing? Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of unbelievable. I've been doing this a while and looking at conversion rates and other products. Uh -huh. Um, the conversion rates that our customers see using Erasmus is astronomical. We have, uh, for instance, Office Depot uses it um, in store and on their um, catalogs and in their advertisements, and um, they got about a 150% increase in conversion by leveraging Erasmus. Um, AMC theaters also kind of lit up every single movie poster, so you could watch the trailer when you're waiting in the, oh, in cool. the lobby. Right. Um, and then if you wanted to, you know, either reserve tickets for that film buy tickets right there, it would use the geolocation to find the nearest theater to you, and you could buy tickets, and they had a 75% click-through rate on that. 75% so, click-through rate? Yes, yeah, on wow. purchasing those tickets. So, you know, it's you know a, such an engaging and tailored experience that it, it's getting these ma amazing ROI numbers. Well, in that, in that theater example, you're probably not even measuring, there wasn't even a click-through rate before, it was just sort of, okay, there's a 
post their advert, so you don't even know what the conversion was. So, I but mean, that's they were a, kind of checking on their versus their website, so being able to just people yeah, browsing right. through films and then do they buy and or maybe not? Maybe stumbling upon it. Okay, and then Optimos is all about multivariate testing, yes. A/B testing, yeah. which of course mm -hmm. A/B testing was all the rage. Test, fail, test again, but it's it's hard to sometimes set up a test and do it different iterations and. Then you get to kind of get exhausted and say, all right, just pick the best one of the end that we did. Yeah. So how does Optimos help that Yeah, problem? I mean, we, Optimos has been doing this for about 15 years, and I think what we provide, um, besides the kind of core technology and the algorithm that finds the best combination of, of images and, and creative, um, is we have a team of experts who have been doing this forever. So it's actually a full SaaS offering. We'll do all the tests for you. Um, we can just kind of take over your website with one line of code, run the test, we can target your website, we can test the segments, do adaptive targeting. Um, and it's it's all done with the idea that we've been doing this for so long, we know what the benchmarks are, and we can guide people in the right direction of where they might be able to kind of improve the lift. So that's interesting. So the business model is a, it's a service as a service? Exactly. <laughs> right. Kind of managed so you, service. So you about, bring yeah. in, okay, so how does that work? So. I have my objectives, this is what I want to do, I want to optimize my website for X, and then you say, great, give us the assets. Yeah, absolutely. And then we'll play with Build it. Build a test and run it until we get the right results. And, and I get to look over your shoulder and we get see all the results. Yeah, you can, can we get a demo account? <laughs> <laughs> we love this product. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, okay, um, and it's, 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 you say it's always been a SaaS-based offering, is that yes. right? Or? Yeah. Okay, so these are two of the core pieces of the SaaS products that Meg always talks about on the, yeah. on the call. Um, I wanted to ask you, so you sell to marketing executives, obviously, yes. you know, the, the CMO. Um, how is selling to that role changing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're hearing a lot about it, and I'm hearing it everywhere I go, every customer I talk to, that the marketing budget you know, I think this year, if not next year, we'll surpass the CIO budget. Uh, they're really the drivers now of all the decisions, like what tools we need, um, how are we going to bring in revenue, and that's what the marketer's role is. And so, you know, IT is becoming a very, like a very strong supporting role in that, but less making decisions on what the products are, especially as we move more into cloud-based offerings. So. Okay, so that's cool. And then, but, but the challenge that marketers have always had is they get, they they want to spend on technology. They have to spend on technology, but they got to go through the technology department to do that. Presumably, a, a SaaS based offering, in part anyway, helps resolve that. So I wonder yeah. if we can talk about that dynamic. Yeah. So I mean, it's and even on the Erasmus side, we just launched our studio store. So the way that you can actually access Erasmus is you go to the or join a studio account, which lets you build your own what we call auras. So anyone can go out there and build it. We have um, thousands and thousands of kids doing it every day, so I know it's pretty easy to do. Um, and you can actually purchase with a credit card right through the Erasmus store. So the marketers can completely bypass any approvals through IT. They can buy what they need for their campaign and run that all through the Erasmus store. And you mentioned you, you sell uh, Erasmus as either an app or you, you've got an SDK. Yes. How are people using the the software development kit? Um, so they're using that to embed the technology into their own app. And so if you have, you know, like the Discover app here, we have the scheduling, you have where, you know, what sessions are, and then part of that is augmented reality. So you can enter kind of that area of the app and that can be able to link anything with it. Do the most shop. of your customers sort of move in that direction or are they just taking the off the shelf app or? Yeah, I mean, some customers, if they don't have an app and they don't want to build one, we can skin one for them. Um, a lot will host their campaign in the Erasmus app because we have a lot of followers anyway, so they're getting the benefit of those users that already have it downloaded. Um, but I think more and more people are trying to build apps that are meaningful, and so adding ways to kind of bridge into the digital world that's not a straight URL, but kind of more of an engaging experience, I think a lot of people are moving in that direction. So I wonder if you could talk about how you guys compete the, how the competition, how you stack up to the competition and kind of what HP brings that's different. So, I mean, I think, you know, Erasmus was kind of like first to market for this. Yeah, so right. um, You don't we, have competition. Exactly. So we hold a lot of patents, um, which is always great to have, especially in emerging technology. 
Uh, so I think we you know, have a really good footprint. So we have 80,000 customers now. Um, and that we do have the broad case of not only having our own app, um, but being able to provide that SDK so people can embed it in their app. So it's a really broad offering. Um, I think that having the HP labs and you know, the HP backing has allowed us to kind of keep up with the competition in that sense. And, and is there a developer angle here? Um, I mean, obviously, when you talk SDK, you've got developers. How do you guys approach those developers? And do you have a, you know, are you building out a community? I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think developers definitely leverage augmented reality. I think any emerging tech developers like to play around with because who knows what it could be. Um, and it's a pretty innovative core technology. So we work with developers um, and provide them the SDK and they play around with the tech. Um, I know that the Sprout team um, in labs was I got an early copy um, when they were working on theirs to see what they could do with Erasmo within the Sprout system as well. How about kind of your to-do list? What are customers asking you to, you know, to, to, to do in the future? I mean, broadly, don't give yeah. us a roadmap. But. I mean, when I think about augmented reality, it's really moving in the, in the direction of kind of replacing search. So right now you walk around the world and you see you know, a billboard or a poster or something you want more information on, and you have to open up a search text box and type in text, and you get more text thrown back at you. So any way we can kind of remove that sense where if you see something you want more information on, put your phone at it, or your wearable devices, you know, if you're wearing glasses or a watch, point that, and then get more information that's highly tailored. So it's taking away the, the need to figure out, translate what that is into a text word and type it into a box. Yeah, so there's hu huge retail uh, opportunities here, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually really interesting. A lot of retail, a lot of publishing, education. Um, healthcare, even? But it, healthcare, I mean, it's kind of, any time you want to link anything physical to the digital world, you think of like, and, you know, also part of the marketing optimization group is Extreme, which pretty much manages and prints every statement you've ever gotten at your home. Um, and you know they always put a URL on that statement, to forcing you kind of to go to the website and maybe check out a promotion or right. get some more information. Um, instead, now you can just point your phone at that statement, and it gives you immediate link to everything that you need. So, how's the adoption? How's the adoption going in terms of uh, market? Is it classic early adopter? Um, how many? You said eighty thousand customers you have. That's a huge number of customers. I mean, I mean, I think you know. People have 11,000 in SaaS, they go public. I mean, 80,000 is pretty, I wouldn't say early adopters. Are they early adopters? Are they more mainstream? Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, I'm trying to understand because like, I love the product already and I want to use it, so how do I get started if I was interested? The first yeah, so, early adopter I mean, it, or not? Yeah, no, I think if we're, we're just, just past early adopter probably. The early adopters were probably publishing and retail and educators. Um, I think the educator piece is interesting. It goes to kind of, um, just the behavior of students, they're so device plugged in already that it was a way for them to talk in a meaningful way. Um, but I think um, we're just past that now and it is getting to, you know, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, CPG, everyone's kind of looking at this rather than just the early adopters. So you guys are nailing what I call the preferred user experience in the future of this mobile-like environment. People want engaging experiences yes. and that's cool, right? So who doesn't like that, right? So. So take us through where the sectors are, for instance, publishing. Let's just say we want to take the cube and have a, a web page that was more dynamic, more cooler, more augmented, with yeah, a variety I mean, of elements. Is, How would we, what would we do? It is super, super easy. As I said, you know, if you just create a studio account, um, erasmus.studio.com, and you can build an aura in less than 30 seconds by uploading what, what you want to trigger, the trigger image, putting an overlay on top of that, whether it's a video or, you know, some people do 3D objects, and if, you, if you have that skill. Um, and <laughs> Whatever then, clickbait you want. And then you kind of just hit <laughs> submit, and it's automatically built and stored in our cloud, and then it works immediately. And mobile, it's all mobile aware, mobile first environment, yep. so it's independent of platform. Yeah, so Android and iOS. And not web. It works on the web too, browsers. Um, yeah, you can work on a browser. Yeah, so that's standard, that's easy. That, that was, yeah, last, yeah, that was yeah. last decade. <laughs> um, but all so all pretty much mobile, like Android and iOS. Android and iOS, yeah. Um, and publishers are adopting this. They were kind of the first adopters. Now it's pretty much any industry out there. What's the pricing look like? So how much would it cost? So it's a subscription-based offering. It's based on the length of the campaign and the number of what we call auras, which is essentially cloud storage. 
So you can buy the annual subscription, monthly subscription, and then how many ores that you're going to build and how interactive they are. So it's okay. on a scale. Are people typically running campaigns for, uh, what's the typical length? Is it I mean, evergreen? Or? Yeah, most people buy an annual subscription because uh -huh. the great news is because it's a web-based platform, you yeah. can dynamically swap the content out in the back end. So they're just building the ores and they might change it over through their campaigns. And, and renewal rates, I mean, if I can yeah, pretty high. with that, pretty high? Yeah. No. With the ROI that people are seeing, it's, yeah. I mean, so, you know, different model, right? The traditional software world, you buy a perpetual license and you live off of maintenance. The SaaS world, yeah. totally different. Good news is, you know, HP doesn't have a huge software business, so you don't have to worry about that transition like a lot of companies. But So there's two metrics, right? It's, I mean, I'm sure there's many, but it's the renewal rate and then sort of the, the ability to to increase the contract value, if you will, the, the subscription value. So you, are you able to cross-sell other products in there, and are you able to see annually average prices yeah, go Yeah, I mean, up? I think it, there's also adoption in there. I think there's a large yeah, part sure. of the population that we can get, so, um, you know, but upselling for customers, we can definitely, you know, it's doing more with the, the product. We also have a way to target um, certain auras, which I think is, you know, kind of further down the road, but it's still built in already, yeah, already right. ahead of the game, but being able to, you know, you'll see something different if you target it on the East Coast versus myself on the West Coast. Um, so giving kind of those different attributes to it. So the market has got to be enormous for these products. Yeah. I mean, can you talk about the TAM at all, or how do you? Yeah, I mean, it's it, the report came out pretty recently um, that said that it's going to be a billion dollars by I think 2018. Um, and just to give some perspective on how fast that's growing, last year they said 108 million. So um, by a factor of 10, it's increased in just a year. Um, and, and I even think that's that's pretty low, but just considering what this technology is able to do, it's really only limited by the behavior. And I always go back to all of the students that are using it today. It's such a core part of their learning experience and their everyday experience that you know the next generation coming up is going to kind of demand um, augmented reality be part of how we're selling to them. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that, that stat, I think it's a Gartner figure that CIOs are going to, or CMOs are going to spend more than, than CIOs. Is that on marketing solutions, or is that in general? I think it's or? on running the business. I also yeah. think marketing is getting a, a kind of more responsibility, I would say, within a company. Um, so before it was, you know, maybe PR and advertising, and now yeah. they're considered the owner of the customer and the customer experience. So, so, so the, the number of a billion by 2018, that's what's going to be spent, but the the potential is tens of And that's billions, just so on AR. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's... But that's the, the digital spend is actually increasing as an overall number. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. much bigger. So, yeah. I mean, it's the, the overall, so, it's you know, So let's talk, about let's talk about engagement. It's one of the things we we're, we're always talking about in Cube is, if we broadcast that, we, we don't really lock the users into any sort of click. It's all free content, right? So, but engagement is something we see a lot of engagement. That's what everyone's talking about right now is engagement. Yep. Give me the engagement, and you build an engaging product. Yes. So you're in that business. So what's your take on engagement? Where are we in that business model? How, I mean, is it going to be new technologies coming out? This is one of them. Um, what's the myths around engagement? It's like now becoming the holy grail. Yeah, I mean, I think before you know, being a marketer, or being a business, it was fairly easy to control engagement because they had to come into your shop um, or call you, and that's you could very much control that one-on-one -on -one engagement with a and customer. Measure and measure it and understand it. Um, and I think that, you know, it became really, really difficult for the last, you know, 10, 15 years with the web and social. And um, now, you know, people want reviews from other people that aren't you. They want to talk to everyone else but you before they talk to you about your product. So they're coming in knowing a lot of things you might not know what they know. And everyone's starting from a different touch point. And there's so many different places to interact with the brand and that the marketer can't really control it. So it all gets back to understanding what those interactions are, understanding what's being said, so that we can continue the engagement. That brings your whole multi-channel into a whole other dimension, really, if you think about it. If the customers are talking about you before they talk to you, yeah. that creates multiple channels within that channel. So you already have multi-channel marketing yeah. things to work on. Now you have sub-channels, if you will. And um, every interaction becomes very important because if you, you know, have a bad review with someone, they can tell, you know, 20 million people like that. So you got to get out front on that yeah. and, and have the technology to do that. What, what's your advice to customers that when you know, I'm a CMO, 
and now I'm being pulled into, okay, the spend is now going to be increased with social and these new engagement platforms. So I don't know what to do. I'm getting pitched from all these different vendors. I got Oracle banging on my door. I got Salesforce. I got, you know, Mintigo. I got you guys. I got a lot of noise coming at me. So yeah. what, how do you clarify that? How would you? I mean, I think, you know, it, it comes from not doing kind of inside out marketing where you look at kind of where where are channels that we manage or you know what's our message, um, but look at kind of how people are interacting with content and information and try to catch them there. Um, I always kind of say, I, I, I started off kind of in the web world when people were just building websites and I was selling software to do that. And you know it was trying to convince people to build a website. And at the time we thought only the biggest, biggest companies are really gonna have websites. Yeah. Or oh, that's and, webs for kids, yeah. no one, yeah. it's not that's relevant. Just, that's just gonna be your American Airlines or Bank of America. But it was, um, you know, now you, know, you have a, a wedding and you build a website for that one event. So it's become so common. So let's take that to social. So social media is the same, that we, this is our, our dominance all the time on the view. The web was laughed at. Oh, there's no ROI on the web. Also, boom, digital's born. Google, all this stuff's happening. Search behind it. So the web's a pretty much done deal. We all see value in that. Um, social's the same kind of critique. It's almost a, it's almost an echo of the early days of the web. Like, oh, social media's just buzz. There's no real ROI there. So everyone's kind of like, where's the ROI? So yeah. are you seeing similar things? And and what would you advise clients as they that that believe? Hey, no, social is very important. Um, I just can't prove it yet, fully. Uh, from a sales transaction. Do you see that as a similar trend, uh, parallel kind of metaphor, and if so, what advice would you give uh, big time CMOs or small businesses? Yeah, and I think you just, you have to think of it less as, you know, we have to maintain our store and our website and kind of the company out communication and go where people are having conversations. So people are, you know, on Twitter and Facebook and all the social medias and, you know, they are using augmented reality um, and it, it becomes, we have to embrace those because otherwise the consumer is leading the way and, and we're not providing the information in the places where they're already interacting. And being relevant too. Yep. Andy, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really fascinating conversation. Obviously digital marketing is just more than selling stuff. It's creating great user experiences in the moment, immersive, relevant, and it's a big data cloud opportunity. Uh, thanks for coming on HP, it's a great solution. We'll be right back. We're here inside theCUBE, live in Barcelona. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.